has anyone at any time, somebody insulted you to your face, how did you respond? I've heard people say, I'll put down my salvation for five minutes and deal with you. <laughs> Has, have you ever experienced somebody lied on you? Oh, yeah. Totally lied. Yeah. And brought witness to say that you said such and such and you knew you never said it. Yes. What do you do then? I heard um, when you get slapped on one cheek, you turn the other cheek. Okay, let's assume you turn the other cheek. What happened when you run out the cheeks? Well, the story we're about to talk about has these elements in it. And... Um, Let me read it and then you'll see the big picture. 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 16. Good, thank you. Then there came two women that were harlots by profession unto the king. And they stood before him. Let me comment as I go before I get into the text. It doesn't matter who you are, what lifestyle you carry. There's a day coming when you'll have to stand before the king. Amen. They stood before the king. Guilty as they were, however their condition is, they stood before the king. And I am asking the people of God to get ready. Because you do not know when you may have to stand before the king of glory. So, in all your sitting down, get ready to stand. So they stood before the king, and the one woman said, O oh my Lord, I and this woman dwell in one house. They shared an apartment. And I was delivered of a child with her in the house. It came to pass the third day, and I will make mention of that important phrase just now. It came to pass that after I was delivered the third day, that this woman delivered also. Three days later, she delivered. And we were together. There were no strangers with us in the house, just the two of us. So whatever happened, happened between the two of us. There's nobody else to blame. Sometimes we look for a scapegoat. Sometimes we look for somebody else to blame, but there's nobody else. It's just more than you. Who's going to believe your side of the story? And the woman's child, verse 19, died in the night because she overlaid it. I will talk to you about the dangers of carelessness. And she arose at midnight. Midnight switch. And took my son from beside me. While my handmaid slept. And she laid it in her bosom. And laid her dead child in my bosom. And when I rose in the morning. To give my child milk. Behold it was dead. But when I had considered it. There are many things we have to reconsider. Talk about that. And the other woman said, No, 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 no. The living son is my son. And the dead is your son. Stealing and lying goes together. And then the other one, no, 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 but the dead is your son. The living is my son. That's a mother's crying. And that's how they spoke before the king. 
Now then, this is uh, the first test of Solomon's wisdom. This follows after the prayer he had asked God for wisdom. And this was the evidence that if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all men liberally and will not withhold wisdom. So there's no reason to be a foolish virgin because wisdom is available to all who would ask. And here was the first test of his wisdom. Then the king said, look, I understand you are saying this is your son and you are saying this is your son and you are saying this is the dead and you are saying this is alive. What's going on here? King said, okay, bring me a sword. And they brought the sword before the king. Imagine the king don't have a sword on his throne. They had to bring one for him. And the king said, divide the living child in two. And give half to the one and half to the other. Then spake the woman who's a living child was unto the king. For her bowels yearned within her. And she said, oh my Lord, my Lord, my Lord, give her the living child. And in no way say it. But the other said, no, no, let it be neither mine nor thine, but divide it. Some people just love division. They just love to divide things. They just love to divide families. They just love to divide people. They just love to divide the church. So it's a response that I want to talk about. The topic, therefore, is... If you take wrong, God will make it right. When you look at the picture, this woman took wrong. Although she was right. But for the health and the welfare of what she brought forth. My subtopic, my theme is let it live. Let it live. Let the church live. Let your relationship live. Let your friendship live. Let it live. Even if you have to take wrong. And trust in the justice of God. Because he will make it right. Let it live. See God wants life in the church. Sardis. Was in a bad situation. I read just one verse. Two verses. And unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works. See, when people don't see what you do, God sees. He knows your works. I know your work and thou hast a name that thou livest and art dead. Ooh. I'm trying to connect this with, with the passage. You have a name that you're living but really, you're dead. This woman claimed that the child was hers. Claiming life when she really produced death. And this is the warning. Be watchful. And strengthen the things which remain. That are ready to die. There's some things in our lives that are ready to die. We are on the edge of death, spiritually. Emotionally, you can't handle it anymore. You have been plagued with so many cares. Your life is cumbered with this and that and the other. And you're on the edge of insanity. You feel like you're going to go mad today because your life is flooded. You have become a Martha twice and not a Mary. You are cumbered and overloaded with many things. And some things in your life is ready to die. It's ready to go, disappear. And it will happen if you, like this woman, become careless. She, the complaint was, Given before the king. And the mother, the real, the mother of the living child, 
was explaining to the king, and in verse 19, he said, this woman's child died in the night because she overlaid it. That means she rolled over on the baby and smothered the baby. In the midnight hour, in the time of darkness, people fall asleep spiritually. They roll over on the very things that they were given life to, and they kill it. That's carelessness. Why the other mother didn't do that? You have to nurture the small things, the baby things that God has given to your life for it to grow. You just got to nurture it. You got to feed your spiritual life. You got to just not drink milk. Get to the place where you can eat meat. Get to the place where you can take an insult and smile. <laughs> Get to the place where somebody lies upon you and you say, God is the judge and God is a witness and he will vindicate me. Do not ever give tit for tat. No, no eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Some people don't give you a tooth, they give you teeth. They give you a full mouth. We have some mouthy people, you know. You just say one thing, as one man said, look, I talk to my wife in sentences, she answers in paragraphs. <laughs> one fellow said, I, you, you're lucky, I talk in chapters, she read the whole book. <laughs> yeah, people love to talk, but blessed are you when you can hold your peace in the face of accusation. <laughs> you know, Pilate was so stunned at the behavior and response of Jesus, he said... Wait, are you just going to stand there and take all this accusation and not defend yourself? And the Bible says he opened not his mouth as a lamb before his sharer is dumb. Sheep, when they go to the slaughter, they don't cry. They, don't, they just remain silent. And, and when you see the enemy coming, there are times when... If you talk, you expose to the enemy things that he shouldn't know. And it pays to stay quiet. Actually, James said, study to be quiet. It's an art. I'm, I'm guilty. My wife has a way of touching buttons that... Ugh. And she knows every button to touch. That's what you get for 52 years. But I touch buttons too. And I annoy her as well. So we are good at annoying each other. But that only lasts for a minute. Next minute, I'm... <laughs> you got to make up quickly. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Oh, don't go to bed angry. Sometimes I'm trying to hug at you, pull a hand away and go. I say, okay, I'm coming behind you. I ain't letting this go anywhere. Oh, hallelujah. You can't afford to be careless with your marriage. You can't afford to be careless with your church membership. You can't afford to be careless with your giving and your receiving. Some people like to give, but they won't receive. They don't want. You ever try to give somebody something and they turn away from you and say, no, I can't have it. Why? That's pride. If somebody give you, no matter if I love when people give me a dozen of egg or two bananas or three apples, I am happy. I am thankful for it because they're giving from their heart. They're giving what they have. If I said, don't give me nothing, then that's pride. You have to not only learn to give, but you have to learn to receive. And when somebody give you a compliment, say, praise the Lord. Just praise the Lord if they say you're a wonderful person. If you're a really good person, just praise the Lord. Give him the glory. You know, compliments are like perfume. It's meant to be inhaled, not swallowed. Because when you swallow compliments, your head swells. So, she overlaid her child because of carelessness. I am saying we can't afford to be careless in these last days. I'm saying as a foolish virgin, you can't afford to walk without extra oil in your lamps. You just have to. And so 
the child died, and this was at midnight. But she switched the child at midnight. The point here is, whatever is done in the dark will be revealed in the light. Many things we do and people can't see, but God sees. And when we do wrong and wickedly and we hide, the Lord will expose it and the Lord will bring it to light. Jesus said so. That which is spoken in the dark will be brought to the light. He said the bushes of ears. What's spoken in the roof that will be heard in the neighborhood. Hey, we can't hide from God for long. We hide from people, but we can't. It, it, the light, the light will reveal it. The word of God will reveal it. So no matter how dark the night is, when the day comes, revelation takes place and people will get to see exactly what happened last night. So she said, you know, I felt the coldness in my bosom. And when I woke up in the morning to give my uh, breastfeed my, my child, the child was cold. I realized this is not my child. And when I had considered it in the morning, you know, I don't know about you, but when I wake up, I wake up about five, six, and I stay on the bed and I consider things. I, I think about how yesterday went and how today should go. I consider, I plan my schedule, what I'm going to do, what I'm not going to do. But most of the times, nothing that I have planned went according to schedule. Because you got to, in my situation, I, I found that you just have to trust God for every hour. You must have a plan for the day. You can't live without a plan. But that plan must be submitted, subjected to the Lord's will. You plan and let God bless it. And if it's not in his will, it's not going to happen. So don't be disappointed when the evening comes. But when the morning comes, consider these things. Consider how many hours you're going to pray today. Consider how much Bible you're going to read today. Consider how many people you're going to call and wish them well. And say something nice to them. And consider how many people you're going to encourage today. Don't just get up and say, I thank God for my coffee and go your way. No. She considered it in the morning, and when she considered it, she discovered the truth. And as you meditate on the word, you will discover the reality of, of life. And the decisions you make during the day will stem from that consideration. And so they begin to argue before the king. This woman who lost her son, she wanted the, the living child. There is an emptiness in some people who craves for life, who craves for joy. They lost it, but they want it, and they don't know how to get it, so they want to steal it from you. Don't let anybody steal your joy. Don't let anybody steal the life that you brought. The ministry that you give birth to, don't let anybody take it away from you. They will lie, they will accuse you, uh, malign you, blackmail you, make your character look bad, destroy your reputation, but because there is a just and a living God, he will vindicate you. And these people, he will make you shine in front of them. Those who deny you, those who uh, pull you down, he will lift you up right in front of them. Somebody said, get and always walk with a chair. So that when God bless you, people won't be able to stand. You'll give them a chair to sit. Because the blessing that's coming upon you is unbelievable. Hallelujah. God will justify you. God will make it right. When you take wrong, God will fix it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And there's this craving uh, for, for life in people who have lost. And we feel, their, we feel their pain. But, but it can't, God can restore these things. You don't have to take it from people. You don't have to snatch people's joy. You don't have to rub anybody of their happiness. God can give it back to you. He's a restoring God. 
He's a God who can make things happen again and again and again. He's a do it over God. And you need to say, do it again, God. Do it again, God. Give me back my joy. Even the psalmist said, oh, Lord, I lost my joy. But give me back my joy. Give me back my joy. I tell you, joy is probably the most precious thing in the believer's life. Hallelujah, because the joy of the Lord is your strength. When you wake up happy and you go through the day, you find strength and energy that you didn't know you had. Praise his holy name. And so the craving can be satisfied because he who made you can forgive your carelessness and restore unto you uh, that which you have lost. There is hope. There is hope. And so the king said, okay, I, I, I hear the case. Bring a sword. And uh, Jace, go bring my sword quick. I forget to tell you that. So he sent for a sword. So I just sent for my sword. Come quick, Jace. But there is also another sword. A sword that divides. But take on the spirit. The word. Don't practice this. Just bring it. Yeah. This was on the pulpit here. This is a symbol. Yes. king said something like this I would imagine put the child there but there is another sword the sword of the spirit that's able to divide the mind the thoughts the heart we want this sword of the spirit not the sword of the flesh because people use the sword of the flesh asked Peter on the night of the betrayal Jesus said I hey, Get, get a couple swords. They said, we have two. He said, that's enough. When the Judas came and the servant of the high priest came to arrest Jesus, Peter didn't. P Peter was a fisherman. He knew nothing about sword. He went to split the man's head. He went for the head. The, the, the high priest soldiers, they wear helmets. And so it didn't cover the air. The helmet came right around here. And so the sword slipped down the slide of the side of these and cut off his air. So Jesus said, put away your sword. Okay. I put it away. <laughs> and because of the use of the sword in the flesh, we have cut off the air of many of a high priest servant who cannot hear what God is saying now. Because Jesus made it clear, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. If you don't have an air, how are you going to hear? Please don't cut anybody's ears off. Don't cut them off from the word of God. Don't point your finger at anybody and say, ah, you're guilty. Some, one pastor said some Christians wear umbrellas in church. And when the word is coming, they say, uh-huh, send it to the back row. It's not for me. Yes, it's for everybody. The word of God is for everybody. The word of God doesn't hit and miss. It doesn't pick and choose. It's the word of life. It comes to you. It analyzes. It sects. It divides. It dissects. It bisects. It trisects. It will cut you up. But make you whole. That's the good thing about the sword. It's a two-edged sword. It cuts and it heals. So the same word that cuts you is the same word that will heal you. Hallelujah. So she said, let it live. Don't kill it. You know how many people that I have heard would like to see deeper life shut down? One sister was telling me that um, Aska, where, right, sister Rani, 
He was telling me. Some, some lady said, um, so where you go to church now? He said, deeper life. He said, you mean that building, that place still open? She said, I heard they shipped the pastor back to his country. You hear lie? You hear rumor? Ask sister what I told her when I said, when, when I heard that. I said, praise the Lord. Go back and tell them we are alive. Go back and tell them after 32 years, we're still standing strong. And no power in hell can divide this church. In 32 years, we never had a split. We never had a split. In a multicultural church, that alone is a miracle. To God be the glory. How do you respond when people accuse you, when people throw insults at you, when people try to pull you down? You just say, God, I leave this matter in your hands. You are the judge and you will vindicate and you will judge right and the, the king judge rightly. And when he said divide, the lady said yes. Divide them. Some people just love division. Paul said, let there be no division among you. No schisms. No little group here and little group there. Cut that out. That's childish. That's not kingdom. That's not the body of Christ. If I decide to cut this hand and put it there. And take this hand and put it there. And take my leg and put it there. And the body is divided. What kind of body am I going to have? The church cannot be divided. The church must be united. It's like the eight day anointing that comes down. From the head of the priest down to his beard in the garment. Oh, how pleasant and good it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Let there be no division in the house. Let it live. Let the church live. Let your marriage live. Let your family live. Let your soul live before God. And if you have to take wrong, take wrong. Let it live. Because God is a good God. And finally, it's happened on the third day. It's very important to me. Three days after, two things existed, death and life in the same room. Picture that in Calvary. That when I died and should have died, rightly so, he took my place. He took my dead child. He hugged it to his bosom and he gave it life. I am alive because he lives. I live again because he rose from the dead. Easter Sunday is not the only day we celebrate life. We celebrate life every day because he lives. He lives in my heart. Three days later, life conquered death. Life won. And you will win too. When things go wrong, he will make it right. Trust in the Lord and he will vindicate you. Whatever you do, let it live. Pay the price and let the church live. If you have to take an insult for the church, take it. The Lord is going to vindicate you.